Welcome to the Dr. Geo podcast. I am your host, Dr. Geo, where it is my intention to help you with your prostate health and how to live better with age. Rana, what a great pleasure that, to have you on. I think uh, most people know about you from the intro. Thank you for being on. You know, we hear your kids, and that's allowed here in this podcast because I have children. <laughs> So not only do they not need to be quiet, they should do whatever they, they do. That, bra that background noise to, to me is actu actually beautiful. So don't no awesome. need, no need to shut them down. It's welcomed. I know in Thank some you. podcasts, they allow for like dog, dogs barking and things like that. Over here, kids. Kids are allowed. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for being Got on. It. I know you had a long day. And um Clearly, uh, you're out west because you have a beautiful background with uh, uh, sunny. For those that are uh, not uh, watching, um, you have a beautiful background there. It's nice and sunny over here. New York is nice and dark, though the weather's nice. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Doing great. Thank you so much for having me, Gio. It's a really pleasure to chat with you this evening. My pleasure. It's, you know, I think you're the first um, urologic oncologist that we've ever had. I have a few others lined up, but you're the first. So I really appreciate it. Oh, that's it. exciting. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, you could have gone in any direction with regards to your specialty. You could have gone into anything, including urology. Even within oncology, you could have gone in a different direction. Why did you go into, why did you go to, into um, urologic oncology and specifically uh, you probably just do prostate or you do bladder and other um, urology? Mainly prostate problems. and, and uh, kidney. Those are my two mm -hmm. areas. Yeah. Why? So I think uh, growing up, I always knew I wanted to go into oncology. Um, I think it hits very close to home. Uh, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was very young. Mm. She was re-diagnosed based on freshman year in high school, freshman year in college, kind of ah. dealing with that. And right. I knew it was something that I've always wanted to do. Um, and kind of go into that field because um, I just felt like what we were doing just wasn't enough and mm -hmm. we needed to do more. And I think what ended up driving me to prostate cancer and genital urinary oncology was my experience in the clinic and mentors. Um, mm -hmm. And I think those two things are kind of helped drive me um, into doing research in this space and caring for patients in this space. Um, I did my fellowship training at the Dana Farber where I absolutely fell in love with taking care of patients with prostate cancer mm. and um, helping them along their journey. Um, you really get to establish these long lasting relationships with the patients that you care sure. for. Yeah, You get to know their family, get to know their kids and their loved ones and caregivers. And, um, you know, that's been really exciting. And, and also the people that do genital urinary oncology, they're pretty cool people. I really enjoy working with them. I enjoy my colleagues. I, I, you I know? agree. Um, you know, I have to say, so you know what I do, right? So, you know, I'm an integrative um, uh, prostate and uro urology uh, doctor. And, you know, most oncologists, Rana, I have to say, they have not been too friendly to me and my, what I do. Why would you? And then I meet you and a few others. And, and then it's like, wait a minute you're an oncologist, typically there's a, some resistance. A, why is that? Do you find uh, that there's uh, still some resistance with um, other approaches that we can do integratively? And oncology, uh, you know, orthos are like sports doctors who, you know, they failed at being an athlete. So they became, you know, <laughs> orthopedic surgeons, uh, kind of be a little tongue in cheek. Uh, um, Oncologists, urologists are fun group in general, on average, right? You're talking about prostates and penises all day, so generally they're a fun group. Yeah. Oncologists are a little bit different, um, and outside of prostate cancer, so it's a good, I was, you know, it's always a good cancer to have if you have to have one. You know, the 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 success rate is not as high, you would say, right? They people die quickly. Why would someone go into it, and why are they so generally? Actually, I have to say, if I give a, if I get the opportunity to give a presentation to a group of oncologists, similar to what I did back at the UCSD, your institution, oh, oh, okay, I didn't know, like I didn't know that there's some science that there's methods of doing this and so forth. So I have to say, but uh, in general, I have to say, even when I first went to NYU, the oncology group wasn't that friendly. Why is that? 
and um and 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 um yeah you could take it from there oh awesome so that was a lot lot of questions about the bundle I know, up I know, there I, was, I, yeah <laughs> i think from as a field i think we've made tremendous headways in yeah. that outcome for patients i mean i look at how immunotherapy has absolutely mm. revolutionized almost every single disease that we treat it's the new mm. chemotherapy mm. and there's people now with advanced disease that you know they're could be cured of their cancer where we we never really even entertain that like i i do a fair bit of kidney cancer and in 2005 the survival was less than a year for somebody with mm. metastatic kidney cancer now the survival is on average five years and mm. there's people that could be cured with immunotherapy so mm. i think it's those success stories that really beautiful. that are beautiful now i think about medical oncologists if i'm going to have to sort of uh um, phenotype, <laughs> my colleagues, phenotype, we, colleagues. yeah, you know, um, <laughs> we're, we're very, uh, data driven people. Yeah. Yeah. We're very, we want, you know, everything that we do is around, show me the phase three trial, show me the level one evidence that right. this is what we should do. And when we don't see that level one evidence, there's a lot of skepticism around what we should do. Um, and what's the right strategy. But, you know, the way I approach things, there's a lot of gray in medicine. That's right. And there's right. way right. more that we don't know yeah. than what we do know. Right. And the trials, you know, there's a whole industry of clinical trial design and yeah. implementation. And there's a lot of stakeholders that are at play from, yeah. you know, patients, clinicians, pharmaceutical companies, regulatory bot agencies, like there's a lot that's at yeah. stake. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a lot of it, I think is that it's like, okay, well, did you, did you do that phase three trial where you gave somebody, you know, a vegetable diet and it demonstrated that it improved their overall survival? Well, <laughs> I don't know about that. Like, you know, we're very critical, right. you know? Right. right. So, to a fault. It's almost like, you know, there's yeah. a saying in Spanish. Um, like, hey, don't look for the fifth leg on the cat. There is no fifth leg. Cats have yeah. four legs. So yeah. oncologists are always looking for the fifth leg on the cat <laughs> and kind of undermining clinical experience, common sense. Also, yeah. like, hey, exercise is good. Yeah. What, what kind of trial do we need to have to say, hey, you know, exercise is good and so forth. Um, and oh, my God, when it comes to herbals and nutrients and nutraceuticals, look out. Uh, they certainly, yeah. you know, and partially is because some of that may interfere with the outcomes of the study that they're trying to where they're trying to look for certain endpoints. Um, but um, I think that uh, as much I look, I'm I'm, I'm as an individual, as a practitioner, I I just came from a health summit and there's like a couple of MDs and so forth. And I'm like, my God, I'm more integrative than these guys. These guys are like like statins are bad. I'm like, yeah. wait, how can, like, yeah. there's a lot of research on statins. Like I recommend yeah. statins to certain people. Yeah. So uh, I am not that I am not, um, you know, certainly I'm not polarizing in any way, but I'm more about what works with the least amount of side effects. That's kind yeah. of the goal. Um, so, um, um, so some of my own colleagues are more on the alternative and natural side than, than I am, but I always found it. I was like, so that's what, how, that's how I present myself to oncologists. Yes. And, you know, in the world of urologic oncology and gen genital urinary oncology, I, there's a little bit of like, I'm known yeah. a little bit more than I used to be. So in fairness, things have changed a, a bit. Um, so, and when I met you, I was like, God, this, like this one, it, it, Dr. McKay is like mm -hmm. very open and kind of has, and you, you asked good questions. You were curious as opposed to, no, that doesn't work or this doesn't work. You were curious. You asked good questions. Yeah. Would it work? Would this black cohosh actually do, work for hot flashes that men, you yeah. know, develop with ADT? And you were very curious about having that conversation. So I was like, wow, this is amazing. I need to have you on. So here you are. Yeah. Uh and for <laughs> me, I, you said something alternative. I am all for complementary strategies, yeah, like yeah. all for it. Like there's so many things that we do. If there's anything that we can do to help better optimize patient outcomes. And it's not all about survival, though yeah. survival is very important. Yeah. It's not all about that. Like if yeah. there's a certain, you know, supplement or lifestyle that's making the patient feel better, like that's like our two goals are make you feel better, make you live longer. Like those 100%. are the two goals. That's 100%. You know? Yeah. Live longer quality of life. Yeah. Live longer quality of life. That's the goal. And if you're living longer and your quality of life is diminished, uh, it's up to the patient to determine if that's good or not. Right. I, I'm not satisfied with that. 
Um, so I don't think, uh, or quality of life, or, you know, uh, they died from some uh, side effect of uh, medications that I'm also trying to offset with some of the things yeah. I do. Uh, I'm just not, that's not success for me. Speaking yeah. of definitions of what things mean, we're going to break it down here, Rana. What, so advanced prostate cancer, the definition I have, and maybe it's, you know, it's from a 2004 paper uh, by Moll down in Duke is uh, the current, it says this, the current er evidence suggests that patients with significant risk of progressive disease and or death from prostate cancer should be included in the definition and that any patient with cancer outside of the prostate capsule with disease stages as low as T3-NOMO, so T3 is a staging, NO means uh, no lymph nodes were found with cancer, and MO means no metastasis, T3-NOMO clearly has advanced disease and should be treated accordingly. So is advanced prostate cancer a little bit of a loose thing or how do you define advanced prostate cancer? What criteria do you use? I, I do think the term advanced is very vague. Yeah. I think when I think about the disease, I think about, um, you know, is it localized? Is it not? Yeah. And I think, I, I'm, you know, when I use the word advanced, I'm like, am I treating them with a curative intent or not? Mm -hmm. And if there's somebody that I have before me that is not getting curative intent treatment, um, that is certainly the definition of advanced, you know, mm -hmm. um, for some reason or another. Mm -hmm. I think the people who are locally advanced, um, that's kind of, you know, a lot of those patients can do well with local therapy and they can be cured of their cancer. And so locally you know, advanced, you would say that's what, so, so what's the, so it's, if it's outside or inside the capsule, right? Gleason score. So let's say Gleason nine. And I think our listeners know there's a, that's a staging system in prostate cancer, the higher the number, roughly between six to 10. Actually, I saw a Gleason 10 today. I don't know if you've seen a lot of Gleason 10s. I've yeah. seen maybe a handful of Gleason 10s in my life, typically nines. And I've never, well, I've seen once a Gleason five. Have you ever seen a Gleason five in your in your career? Well, no, I uh, <laughs> like, a, like a two plus three. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, so or three uh, plus two. Yeah, so um, yeah, not so common. Not too worried about those guys, but I think um, yeah. yeah, I think locally advanced. I would basically put that in the category of anybody who's got extra capsular disease, so spread out of the capsule into the seminal vesicles. You know, nodal disease. Um, you know, Margins. some may even. Yeah, yeah. Some may even put patients that are just high risk based off of PSA and Gleason score as locally advanced. Like if you've got a Gleason 10 cancer, but on imaging, it's confined to the prostate, like that's still concerning, you know. Got so, it. so if it's a Gleason, I don't know, eight or higher, I think uh, um, eight or higher, um, even if it's contained within the prostate. Um, and certainly if it's outside the prostate, whether it's seminal vesicles, extra capsular extension, which is, which just means that it's outside of the capsule, um, a positive margins, things like, uh, that. And certainly beyond that, um, it's considered you, I would say, yeah, that's advanced uh, prostate cancer, yeah. maybe Gleason seven, um, um, uh, uh, even four per th plus three, yeah. plus three is not, but Gleason seven, four plus three with positive margins or outside the capsule. Right. So then is still advanced yeah. prostate cancer. Is it, I mean, are we, are, are we getting into the weeds here a little bit or, or does it matter? Into the weeds, it, a little bit into the weeds. I mean, I think I rely on sort of like NCCN guidelines, yeah. you know, low risk, intermediate risk, high risk yeah. that kind of takes into account PSA, Gleason and stage into yeah. kind of categorizing patients. I really think what's changing the field about our definitions of advanced and metastatic is the introduction of PSMA PET imaging. hundred percent. So we're seeing, Can you go like, into that a little bit more? Oh yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's PSMA PET, PET imaging is a uh, functional imaging. Um, that's a little bit different than, um, you know, anatomical imaging on CT or MRI. Yeah. It's assessing sort of function, bone scans, a functional te metabolic test, you know, some of the MRI, uh, you know, the multi-parametric MRI, like DW, I, those kinds of parameters are functional things, but basically we're able to detect uh, P, recurrent uh, metastatic disease or recurrent disease um, with greater um, sensitivity and specificity than what we would normally detect on CT bone scan. 
So mm-hmm. I think we're seeing sort of stage migration and, you know, what we kind of grapple with in the field is, you know, those patients who may be having metastatic disease by conventional, by, by PSMA PET imaging, but they're negative by conventional imaging. Mm-hmm. How do you care for them? You know, if they're localized and they've got some PSMA positive something out of their prostate, um, but their CT scans are normal, their bone scans normal. How do you contend with that individual? And the answer um, is we don't know yet. We don't know yet. We don't really yeah. have great data. And I think right. a lot of it is is value driven. And I think, you know, in my practice, we tend to still be pretty aggressive with those patients and mm. not necessarily defer local therapy if it aligns with the patient's goals. You know, um, I think the other the flip to that is, you know, do you categorize somebody that's metastatic disease on on PSMA PET imaging as though they were metastatic on conventional and wed them to lifelong ADT, lifelong hormone therapy escalation with an NHT? Um, or do you do short course therapy with SBRT to those areas? Like there's a lot of gray. We don't have any trials to guide what to do. And I think in clinical practice, a lot of it is driven by what are the goals of the patient and the values of the patient, you know, right. to help decide what best to do. Yeah. So um, to break that down just a little bit, um, you know, you're trying to decide, you know, do you do radiation with ADT in some of these cases? Do you do SBRT is a form of radiation known with great branding, cyber knife, but it's really stereotactic radiation therapy is unbelievable. It's like we call it, you know, it's like Kleenex, uh, great branding. Uh, but it is SBRT and there's numerous technologies that um, that have this, this type of uh, machinery. Um, so that's that is the, the, the million dollar question, you know, um, it is interesting. And as you said earlier, the more research you do, you do sometimes the more questions you have. And at the end of the day, we're in the trenches uh, and we have yeah. to make decisions for our patients uh, that make sense uh, for 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 the for their longevity, for their lifespan and health span. Um, yeah. is always a goal. You know, um, God, I, I, you know, we can talk about all sorts of uh, treatments for advanced uh, prostate cancer, and I'm going to try to, it's almost like when I'm watching my son play baseball, I committed <laughs> to not say anything and not yell anything. And you know, I'm like, uh, uh, hey, uh, elbow up, elbow yeah. up. Uh, you know, so I'm going to hold back from asking questions other than ADT so that we are more, uh, we can go kind of narrow and deep, uh, to, in this topic. So androgen or, or, or anti, uh, testosterone, anti androgen therapy of all sorts. Um, a lot of uh, the, 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 one of the main questions that, um, the patients ask is because they're reading things in the internet. So I think good, um, physicians like, um, Abraham Morgenthaler, for example, says, well, you know, he's kind of debunked and perhaps proven that, you know, testosterone does not um, induce prostate cancer. Um, In some cases, testosterone can be given in some cancer patients, active surveillance, low risk, and there's methodologies. And of course, um, other people are studying things like uh, bipolar androgen therapy, which um, maybe we'll talk about towards the end. Um, So, if that's the case, right? So how can we do uh, ADT? How can we castrate, chemically castrate uh, these men if testosterone is not the uh, inducer or the cause or the gas that lights up the fire, to use all these analogies? Why, how is that a, um, a viable treatment and why is it? Very good question. So I think there's a lot of mixed studies yeah. on whether a hypogonadal state or hypergonadal state is associated with prostate cancer onset. So low testosterone or very high testosterone or very high T a lot of kind of, you know, observational studies, large cohort studies, and whether somebody has high T or very low T Mm. does not necessarily seem to be associated with prostate cancer onset Mm. or for an individual who does have prostate cancer. We know that those tumors largely most tumors are driven by uh testosterone they're driven the androgen receptor is sort of the the pinnacle of sort of the pathogenesis around prostate cancer so now whether that, somebody is yeah. that it? it so it's not 
testosterone or maybe testosterone plays a role or not. It's not uh, DHT, the uh, dihydrotestosterone, the metabolic. It's the receptor that's probably signaling the cancer to keep growing. Is that more or less or that's, that's correct. correct? I mean, that's probably how I would put it, that, the, yeah. you know, the most common alteration in prostate cancer are alterations in the androgen receptor. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be the key, you know, driver um, mm -hmm. in the disease pathogenesis. Now, like I said, it doesn't matter what state you are in, but once you get prostate cancer, mm -hmm. it's a very hormonally driven, you know, tumor. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, if we were going to think about targeted therapy, you can think of hormone therapy as one of the very first targeted therapies. Like mm -hmm. literally we're targeting that receptor, like 19, mm -hmm. 1940s, you know what I mean? Yeah. Huggins. And a very targeted therapy. Yeah. Um, Good. But it works, but not everybody needs treatment. That's, you know, that, you know, so, but so it not, does, it's highly effective, but it not everybody necessarily needs treatment. Not everybody needs androgen deprivation therapy. Sure. There's a ton of different formulations and types and durations. Yeah. Right. So, the, so clearly, so we're talking about uh, advanced risk or high risk uh, prostate cancer in which there could be numerous treatments for, but let's just say that, you know, ADT certainly, or um, androgen therapy of some sort or another is one of the most common uh, methods. Um, and you know, what, you know, obviously you can imagine, I see a lot of guys in my clinic who say, uh, look, I'm not doing that. I don't want to do it, you know, or I'm not doing it uh, or they're resistant. They're resistant to a certain point. Um, I'm actually, once again, like I said earlier, I said, well, no, maybe you should consider it. They would never think that I would say that they think that I would say, Oh sure. Just keep doing this alternative yeah. thing. So it's interesting um, because I, it's one thing, certainly the way I run my practice is um, three things. Yeah. The research, but not only the research, um, it's clinical experience and just common sense based on knowing the biology of prostate cancer and some of those things that, you know, that, that would make sense for them to do. So I think, um, so there are about three types of, me three methods of reducing testosterone to zero or almost zero. One is um, LHR, uh, uh, LHRH agonist. So these are luteinizing hormones, releasing um, hormone agonist. And just for the listener, I'm going to, for the next 10, 20 seconds or so, I'm going to break down how testosterone works so that we can kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 reverse engineer it to see what, to, that the listener knows what we're trying to do. So um, um, testosterone is produced, so it's a, it's a process, is a pathway is producing uh, an area in the middle of the brain called the hypothalamus pituitary gland. Hypothalamus releases um, gonadotropin releasing hormone. These names don't matter, but we need to call it something to, to make it, to make sense of it. Gonadotropin releasing hormone, which then goes into the pituitary gland. Again, you can look this up on the internet, what they look like. That's not relevant. Then that releases two things, LH, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. These hormones then go to two places. One is the adrenal glands. The other is to the testes in men. And it attaches to a receptor. So oral hormones, as we've been a long time listener, we talk about lock and key scenario with hormones and neurotransmitters and chemicals and receptors. Um, so this particular hormone um, attaches to a receptor in the testes or adrenal glands. Adrenal glands are soft little tissue on top of the kidneys only releases about five to 10% of testosterone uh, and androgens. Uh, the testes produces uh, the most of the androgens and testosterone. And then from that pathway, LH attaches the receptors in the testes, and then you make testosterone. And that's important to know only because we're trying to interfere with many of these pathways and when we're doing uh, ADT. So the three categories that I'm aware of, and if there's others, let me know, is LHRH agonist, so luteinizing hormone, agonist. There are anti-androgens, and then there are um, um, LHRH antagonist. Uh, uh, if that, and, and is mm -hmm. that uh, other than physical castration, right? Of, right. Yeah. Other than just castration. Right. So those are the big three. Yeah, we can go into those. Let's do it. So 
patient comes in and we could maybe a real life example, you know, Gleason nine and, and, you know, part of advanced prostate cancer uh, kind of to go back a little bit in that definition, because it's important is, you know, you have low risk prostate cancer. Initially, you get treated with a prostatectomy or something. You're fine. Years later, there's a rise in PSA and now there, the rise is significant. So now that's considered advanced prostate cancer as well, where some people will have to go, you know, some of these treatments that we're about to talk about. Um, so what would be the first line of therapy out of all these? Um, and you can kind of um, talk, uh, you know, sure. uh, Lupron and all the names and kind of take us through that journey. Sure. And um, what, what determines your decision making? Like, yep, you need to be on Lupron or um, uh, some of these anti-adrogens like um, uh, um, Orgovix, which is the yeah. brand name and so forth. So, What's your thinking yeah. process? So we can talk about it. So um, the first I will say is the anti-androgens alone are non-castrating therapy. Anti-androgens actually cause an elevation in testosterone. The anti-androgens bind to the androgen receptor and prevent testosterone from binding to the receptor that signals back to the brain saying, hey, there's no testosterone around. The mm -hmm. brain just makes more testosterone, but the testosterone mm -hmm. doesn't work. You're basically mm -hmm. blocking the key from entering into the lock. Mm -hmm. So anti-androgens alone, bicalutamide, enzalutamide, apalutamide, darolutamide, alone, they actually increase the levels of testosterone mm -hmm. in a patient's body. And actually in concert, because there's more testosterone, increase the amount of estrogen in a patient's body. Mm -hmm. um, so they're technically not considered castrating therapy. Now, with regards to the castrating therapies, mm -hmm. which is a terrible term, and we need mm -hmm. to figure out a different one because it's not great. It's not they patient are. friendly. It's not, you know, it's just like not great. Oh yeah. Let me sign up for that. Oh, the castrate yes. therapy. Yeah. That's exactly yeah, what I need. That's exactly yeah, that's what, what I, want. I want. What, what do you want me to do? <laughs> so you've got GNRH antagonist and GNRH agonist. So GNRH agonist. So normally when the pituitary or the hypothalamus is secreting the GnRH releasing hormone to the pituitary. In normal physiology, it's done in a pulsatile fashion. So mm -hmm. it kind of, you get little bursts here and there, and um, you know, you can uh, continue to stimulate LH and FSH production. When these drugs are used, there's continuous stimulation. And I think of it like the boy who cried wolf, when you are just continually stimulating the axis, the axis just shuts down. There's mm -hmm. a negative feedback that shuts down the axis and then you stop making testosterone. Mm -hmm. So most of the therapies like the GnRH agonists, uh, they're- What's an example? Uh, Luprolide, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, Eligard, Lupron, yeah. Trellstar, right. Tryptorelin. Those yeah. are all examples of LHRH agonists that Agonist, basically yeah. sh shut down the axis. Mm -hmm. um, the- Initially, when you use one of these agents, because they're stimulating, um, they're, they're agonists, initially when you use them, they can cause a testosterone surge before that testosterone drops. And in most scenarios, that surge is clinically irrelevant. Um, and sometimes we treat that surge by giving somebody an antiandrogen so we can block whatever testosterone's around. But in most scenarios, that surge is not really relevant. Mm -hmm. I think the main scenario where it could be relevant is somebody who's got metastatic disease, who's got a big bulky tumor in their prostate and you don't want them to obstruct, or they've got disease in their spine, you don't want it to grow, uh, where it's critically important to use an antagonist. So an antagonist is just that. Instead of having an initial surge um, and stimulation to cause negative feedback, you just shut down the axis. Mm -hmm. And there's two FDA approved um, anti or, um, uh, antagonists, and one is called Degarelix. Mm -hmm. It's a once a month subcutaneous injection and the other novel uh, therapy. Otherwise known as Fermagon as the brand name. Exactly. Fermagon. And the other therapy is called Relagolix, which is actually the first oral hormonal agent for mm -hmm. patients with prostate cancer. Or um, yeah. Yep, yeah, exactly. That's a and, brand name for that. Yep. And these drugs prevent that initial testosterone surge. Um, and, you know, where, where I'm definitely jumping to using uh, an LHR or a GnRH antagonist. It's those people that have metastatic disease that I'm worried about them flaring. Um, but there's actually some potential positive benefits to using an antagonist over an agonist. Uh, there's data to suggest that the uh, while you get more dramatic testosterone suppression on therapy, when you stop therapy, the time to testosterone recovery tends to be a lot quicker. And there's some 
controversial data around the cardiovascular profiles that they could be a little bit more favorable with an antagonist versus an agonist. Right. So that's what I've seen. And thank you for explaining that. Um, you know what I think I read? And I, I, I'm all over the, you know, it's everything prostate. So it's not just advanced. So I'm sometimes like, oh, I don't even know what I'm reading, <laughs> reading, but tip, I, from a journal. Um, so I clinically have seen, so be, when Orgovix came out, uh, and I call it by its uh, brand name, which is, again, a GNRH uh, uh, antagonist, when, when it came out and people started using it, um, I was like, this is remarkable. It's almost like I'm making a deal with the devil by saying this because it's like you're not supposed to, you know, be kind to these drugs. Um, the easy to take. So the injections with the Firmagon, people complain about a lot and they do yeah. it sub subcutaneously once a month. So they complain about that little lumps and all kinds of things that they yeah. develop. Oral, right? Side effect profile, really low, mm -hmm. really low. Um, and then the cardiovascular risk is even lower. My understanding, and I like to know why, and I don't know if you know, but I read in one of the journals that it's because there is um, there is a significant drop in the production of follicle stimulating hormone, yeah. and follicle stimulating hormone FSH can in, in excess uh, induce cardiovascular problems. Yeah, yeah, is I that think that's happening? the. I think so. I think that's the current school of thought around mechanistic rationale for why that could be. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And I, I think what the beauty about an oral medication is, you know, especially for those individuals that are really hesitant about going on ADT um, or potentially you're concerned about them, like they're, they're older, uh, maybe mm. more frail, but they've got advanced disease and potentially need treatment. Um, you, you know, you're not signing up for the full, you know, six month or 12 month or you're, you're signing up for one day at a time. Mm. And, you know, you can easily stop the medications if you run into trouble. Um, most people rebound their testosterone pretty quickly. Mm. So there's a lot of, you know, pros to taking an oral hormonal agent, um, you know, especially in the short, I love using it in the short term. I love mm. using it for, you know, people that just need three or six months of therapy and then you're stopping because you're, you know, you want their T to come back pretty quickly. You don't want them to have any issues. So I think it's perfect in that category. Mm. There. So once people start on some sort of anti-androgen therapy, whether it's um, uh, uh, the Lupron or uh, Firmagon or um, enzalutamide and apiraterone, which are the anti-androgen bicalutamide, um, so there, there's two things that can happen. These are hormone sensitive prostate type of prostate cancer, and it works until the point where then it becomes resistant to prostate to the to the therapy. Um, so do they each have their own uh, limitations as to when they become resistant to the therapy? So uh, the Lupron versus Abiraterone is Lutamide versus uh, Orgovix or uh, Firmagon. How does that work? I'm more familiar with the um, GNRH agonist and their resistance within one to three years, roughly, but I'm not as familiar with the other drugs and the process of it becoming resistant where it stops working and the PSA will go up regardless. Yeah. So how does that work? So I think, um, I guess, stepping back from an efficacy standpoint, I think we view the GNRH antagonists and agonists as fairly similar with regards to their efficacy. Okay. Um, I think when we're talking about the localized disease setting, usually patients are undergoing a finite duration of therapy and then therapy is discontinued. And then you're watching them to make sure that they stay in a remission and are cured. Mm. In some scenarios, based off of data from a large UK study, we incorporate drugs like abiraterone for a period of time for localized disease. So that's, I, th I would think of localized disease being cured of treated with a curative intent as its own thing because because we're treating patients with therapy for a finite period of time. Now, in the advanced metastatic setting where people have widespread metastases, um, we're treating patients continuously without stopping therapy. And I think this is kind of speaking, Gio, to what you were talking about, resistance emerging. And so in the context of continuous treatment because people have advanced disease. And we've done the studies for people with advanced disease looking at, or metastatic disease looking at, does intermittent therapy 
is that associated with better or worse outcomes compared to continuous therapy and continuous, you know, intermittent therapy is, um, you know, not equivalent to continuous and continuous is associated with improved outcomes. So in the metastatic setting, people with bona fide disease that spread everywhere, we kind of treat them continuously. At least spread that's what everywhere to the bone, not everywhere, but bone, you know, 80% of patients have bone meds. The next common site is lymph node. There can be patients with visceral metastases. I think mm. we're seeing more visceral metastases, quite honestly, with mm. PSMA PET imaging, liver, lung. Um, but mm. in that setting, they're treated continuously. And we're sort of, um, you know, uh, and now what we're doing is in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting, we've done studies looking at just doing ADT by itself or adding one of these oral agents to ADT. And we've demonstrated that if you add any one of the oral agents, like pick your pick your drug, ADT plus X, regardless of what X is oral agent wise, you get improved overall survival compared to ADT alone. So now we're like escalating in the metastatic hormone sensitive setting with drugs like Abby, Enza, Dara, and we're prolonging overall survival. We're prolonging the time to castration resistance, but then resistance can emerge via either mechanisms driven by the androgen receptor around the androgen receptor. And we can talk about what those are or mechanisms that are independent of the androgen receptor. Mm. So, you know, cancer is very smart. The androgen receptor can mutate where these drugs don't work anymore. Instead of functioning to shut down the axis, it can turn on the axis. The androgen receptor can multiply. So you've got amplification of the androgen receptor and the therapy is no longer effective. There can be splice variants where you lose the area where the drugs are binding to, where testosterone is binding to, and it's just like the doors open. You can't, you know, it doesn't matter about the, the lock and key are gone. The doors just open. Yeah. And so there can be mechanisms like that. There can be mechanisms that are not driven by the androgen receptor, you know, through other pathways, RB, PI3 kinase, all this alphabet soup, basically, that medical oncologists like to get excited about. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, thank you for explaining that. Um, so this combination therapy, so we're talking, um, ADT, so maybe Lupron, let's say, which is a very popular one that m uh, many people are on, um, uh, and, um, Abiraterone, you said Abby and Enza, uh, Abiraterone, uh, mm -hmm. also known as Zytiga, and Zalutamide, also known as, um, Zanti. Um, those combined gives you a better outcome in terms of survival. What is the how long before that combination um, it becomes uh, stops working, um, if at all? So we know that on average, one to three years before just um, a uh, ADT stops working and it becomes resistant it, with that combination. Do we know yet when it becomes resistant? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's a there's a lot of data from the phase three trials about time to castration resistance. I think for those patients that have like high risk, high risk, high volume disease you know, maybe the average time is around three years for the high risk, high volume, the people with low volume disease, the people with disease where they are not de novo metastatic, they presented with localized disease, and then they kind of work their way into becoming metastatic. Those patients actually do the best. Their time to castration resistance can be very, very long, you know, sometimes up to 10 years, you know, so but for those high risk patients, the patients that I tend to see in my clinic, they have a high, you know, disease that you know, new diagnosis, metastatic prostate cancer. They've never had localized disease with bone meds and lymph nodes meds. It's roughly around three years. Um, there could be people that could do really well. There can be people that can do even worse, um, lower than that, but roughly around three years. And that's with c continuous, continuous therapy. Continuous therapy with, with adding one of these NHTs and then kind of strategizing after that to see what we're going to do next. Adding one of these NHTs. What do you mean by that? And it, so it's probably a misnomer now because they're no longer novel, novel hormonal therapy, NHT. Uh, yeah, exactly. Abby's been around since 2011 yeah. and it's now yeah. generic. So it's no longer novel, yeah. okay. but we still kind of call it that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Right. It was like a novel. Uh, I've, it's been a while. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, so those with very advanced disease, uh, probably they'll be resistant in one about three years. Those that are, don't have quite so the ones that would benefit um, that let's say ten years down the line they're still doing well. What kind of presentation, clinical presentation, would they have? So clinical presentation, um, 
is somebody with low volume metastases, oligometastases, less than five mets, no liver mets, no lung mets, um, uh, metachronous disease, meaning they presented with localized and then became metastatic as opposed mm -hmm. to presenting with metastatic disease mm -hmm. right from the right from onset of diagnosis. Um, honestly, we're learning a lot about the genomics of these tumors and yeah, it's driving yeah. what we do as well. Yeah. Um, tumors that have S-pop alterations tend to be very responsive to hormonal therapies. The three bad actors that we all worry about are RB loss, P10, uh, P53. We see those, you know, especially if somebody's got more than one of those alterations, that could be a sign that they're going to be resistant to hormone therapy. So that actually also impacts decision-making and how you escalate or de-escalate therapy. Like, does everybody need everything? And like, who needs more and who needs less? We don't, you know, we need to do trials where we're looking at escalation and de-escalation strategies. Right. Those are genetic tests that you identified, um, P10, um, ROS, or RAS, and what was the other? It was, it's RB1 and yeah. P10 and um, TP53. Those TP53. are the three tumor suppressor loss genes that are just associated with more aggressive disease, more hormonal resistance. Yeah. Um, and you can get that tested uh, saliva test, I think, right? And there's many companies that do that, uh, or, or are, there's also, you could do it blood test. Uh, yeah. You, so, yeah. Go ahead. So that test is a tumor profiling test. Yeah. So there's, you know, you got germline testing, which can be done with a saliva or just a That's tube right. of blood looking at your white blood cells, but then you've got somatic tumor profiling, which somatic yeah. is like looking at the tumor. So, um. But right. everybody should undergo saliva testing, like you said, Gio. Absolutely. Yeah. So these tests that uh, we can identify, uh, P10 and all these other uh, Alphabet City, um, um, those are very specific to the to the tissue itself. You can utilize that tissue and send it for testing. Yeah. Is that um, – what are the companies? Is that Polaris and those type of companies that do, that do so that type of testing? So it's more so like the companies would be – you know, Foundation, Tempest, Keras, they're d doing somatic tumor profiling. So it's, you could do it on tissue or yeah. you could do it on circulating tumor DNA. Right. So, you know, they could do it on a blood, like Garden has a blood test. The blood's not as great as the tissue. Tempest has a blood test. So, um, but you're looking at the tumor to see what the heck's going on in the tumor. Rana, I don't know that, I mean, am I, I don't see everyone having this type of information. Uh, is everyone on the same page to, in ordering these type of tests to know exactly what they have or what are we doing? No, there's probably a lot of variability in practice. You yeah. Know, I, you know, for anybody who's got metastatic disease, the guidelines recommend germline testing and somatic tumor profiling. Why I do this is it impacts prognosis for that patient. Yeah. It impacts my ability to get them targeted therapies, like yeah. if they're found to have a certain mutation, specifically a BRCA alteration, mm. homologous recombination repair, which, you know, I think if we look at it in aggregate, 20 to 30% of patients, they could get an additional drug that they other, that could benefit them and improve their yeah. outcomes. Mm. And then I think the other thing for germline testing, you know, the other reasons to consider it is, especially those people that may have localized disease, um, you know, screening for other cancers for that patient if they're mm. positive, cascade testing for their family members. Um, so the same, you know, hereditary gene that causes breast cancer in women causes prostate cancer in men. Yeah. And the mothers of these, you know, the the moms of these these men may be at risk of breast cancer. And and so so there's a there's a huge link. But I think um there's a lot of you you probably see this is just a different culture around mm. prostate cancer and the uh, advocacy around prostate cancer compared to the culture for breast cancer and advocacy around breast cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, That's it's right. almost like taboo for screening, talking about, it's just different, you know? <laughs> um, so absolutely right. A absolutely right. Unfortunately, um, I saw more, I saw two cases today of men that appeared, uh, this is not the first time, but when they first appeared with their, at least just getting a PSA, it was in the thousands. Wow. Um, so there is a, um, some men think, uh, and, and I know the psychology, and we, that's a topic for a different podcast episode, but briefly, some men, th some men think that um, ignorance is bliss and not knowing and not checking is bliss. 
And I can say with a high level of certainty as a man, and I understand that no one wants to be vulnerable or no man, vulnerability for men is not a, a great feeling. But even those men that think that ignorance is bliss later on, they say, oh, I wish I would have done if I, you know, if I would have done this and there's some level of guilt, which is also not good, but I don't think not knowing or not screening or not looking at things is the right answer. Um, and we haven't helped people along there, right? Like as a medical yeah, community, right. the, the information around prostate cancer screening, there's so much controversy and um, just kind of misinformation. PSA you know, doesn't matter. Process. Well, yeah. the doc, they say I read PSA doesn't matter. So why are we yeah. doing a PSA? Right. So there's a lot of that's that is that is um, that is uh, and, and one thing is what they read in the media. One thing is what the some agencies you know I, uh, we're, we're doing the U.S. U.S. Uh, Preventative Task Force. I did them more harm than good. Actually, yeah. I know what they were trying to do. What they were trying to do makes sense. There is overtreatment, so we, they're trying to cut back on that, and I get that. But to go the other way, or the other way completely. Yeah. Um, I think then we we all saw you, your practice started probably becoming oh, busier. Oh yeah, we see it. <laughs> it's migration. I mean, more people presenting with metastatic disease, yeah, more people exactly. presenting with advanced disease, and for the longest time we were seeing declines in overall declines in mortality. Yeah. And over the last couple of years, mortality has plateaued. It's yeah. not declining; it's plateauing. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and we've got new, better drugs. I mean, it's. I think it's largely driven by people not being tested. And, and what's so funny is in the oncology guidelines and like NCCN guidelines, if you look at those, they've actually dropped the screening age from 50 to 45. That's right. And, and like, you know, especially for African-American men, we haven't talked about the disparities, you know, hundred percent. Or if you have a first, listen, you're, you're, you're 40, you're 38 years old. You come into my office and I know you have a strong family history of prostate cancer. We're getting oh, a yeah. PSA. I hear you. <laughs> we're getting, we're getting a PSA. African American men, you're getting a PSA at you know even before 40. Yeah. At least we have a baseline, um, yeah. and we can look at things um, uh, earlier for sure. Um, we, you spoke a little bit about intermittent androgen uh, deprivation therapy. It's a fascinating idea, at least theoretically, because mm -hmm. it's supposed to do two things. And while I don't prescribe any of these drugs, one of my roles with my patients is look, I'm your quarterback ask your oncologist about uh, about X, Y, or Z. I do ask them to look at, I say, ask them about uh, inter intermittent androgen therapy. And the reason for that is two reasons. One is to lower the risk of a metastatic resistance, a resistance to me metastatic disease, um, resistant uh, metastatic, uh, resi what am I trying to say? It's, it, you know, it is almost 10 o'clock. Castration resistant, CRPC, resistant. more alphabet soup. <laughs> that, that, that's more right. alphabet soup with more terms <laughs> that we don't want to use like castration, you know, it's crazy. It becomes a tongue twister after 9 yeah. p.m. Yeah. here Eastern time. Um, so you don't want the, the drug not to work. So that's one reason to do intermittent at ADT. The other reason is quality of life, right? So you get some little testosterone back. Some of these guys are like, man, and now, you know, they get to know the difference. They were an ADT, you know, testosterone zero. And once their testosterone reaches only like 200, 250, they're like, oh my God, this is like yeah. amazing. So I'm interested for that, but obviously I want to make sure that we don't do the wrong thing as it relates to the cancer itself. So you might've mentioned this before, but what is your approach for intermittent androgen therapy yeah. as opposed to continuous? So where that um, is applicable is predominantly in people who have biochemically recurrent disease. So it's people who had their initial prostate treated, whether with surgery or radiation, mm -hmm. they've relapsed. They don't have any additional salvage treatment options. If it's somebody that had surgery, they went on to have radiation, or maybe they just decided radiation wasn't for them. They didn't want to go down that route, or they already started with radiation and there's no salvage therapy options. So in that scenario, we scan them and there's no evidence of metastases. In that scenario, we can um, think about intermittent therapy. And I tell patients, you know, not everybody who has a PSA rise after their definitive local treatment needs treatment. Mm. If your PSA doubling time is long over a year, um, the absolute number is low. You know, I have patients who their PSAs are 10 something. It's their PSA doubling time is four years. It's taken them almost a decade to get to 10. Fascinating. I'm not, Fascinating. I'm not giving them hormone therapy. They're, we're just going to watch them. Fascinating. You know, that's a great point. That's a great point. S However, sometimes it's patient driven. 
They're it numbers people. They're yeah. finance. They're into finance. They're into yeah. numbers. And so numbers tell a story and they think of life very linearly. PSA yeah. going up is bad. I want it down, period, end of story. Yep. And um and and they but driven by patience. And you know, what are you gonna do? All right, let's let's drop it. I mean, what are you there's only one yeah. way to drop it. I mean, you can educate them, but they don't want to hear it. Um, but I think that's a fascinating point that not every recurrence after prostatectomy or radiation therapy or prostatectomy then followed by radiation therapy requires um, it depends on multiple factors, a PSA right. velocity, just like it was before yeah. treatment. And to determine if you even had prostate cancer, PSA velocity still matters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in that case, when they're OK, so let's just say there is a recurrence. You do put them on ADT, but you'd say, OK, maybe we could do intermittent ADT. Yes. So in that what, scenario, is your, yeah. what is your approach? When do you put them on? When do you take them off? And how do you determine whether they need to go back on? Yeah. So very good question. I think there's really no, you're not going to go into a textbook and tell you like at this level of PSA. You mean there's no life. randomized trial showing <laughs> well, this exactly. Actually, <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, AUA just at the American Urologic Asso uh, Association mm -hmm. meeting just happened um, at the end of April. And there was mm -hmm. data from a landmark study called Embark. Mm -hmm. And Embark was a trial that looked at escalated hormone therapy for those high risk people. So for mm -hmm. those people that have and I think they had to have a PSA of two or greater to enroll. Um, they had a PSA doubling time of less than nine months, less than 10 months. So fast doubling time. They randomized patients with three arm study. They randomized them to just Lupron alone, mm -hmm. enzalutamide alone. So non-castrating therapy, enzalutamide alone, or the doublet. Mm -hmm. And the primary endpoint was metastasis free survival. And they looked at overall survival and other intermediary endpoints. And it was a positive study. I mean, it was tremendously positive and I think it's going to change practice. So I think for those high risk people that are, their PSA is just like skyrocketing. Their doubling time is like one month. Every time they come in, it's like, you know, it's going from one to, to two, five, 10, like just like quick, 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 you know, they probably need to get started sooner rather than later because the doubling time can be associated with time to metastasis onset. And so- yeah. What um, the study showed what that that the, the, the both treatments with uh, anti androgen so um, they looked used Lupron enzalutamide or both which correct. arm showed better results the combination of Lupron plus enzalutamide yeah resulted in dramatic improvements in metastasis free survival almost fifteen percent delta in MFS mm -hmm. between the two arms with a trend for overall survival though the overall survival is still limited. But I think what was also really important about this study that I thought was quite interesting is um, looking at the enzalutamide arm, because I think we see a lot of patients who they're like, I don't want to go on hormones, but just put me on bicalutamide by itself. Like, I don't want to drop my T levels. Like, and the data weren't as great, even with a next generation, um, you know, anti-androgen by itself. So, you know, but the decisions here, I think they're not, you know, you have the trial data, but when you have the patient before you, you know there's a lot of things that you weigh on the scale of what, what matters for any given patient determining what you're going to do. And on the trial, they gave patients one year of therapy and on that study. So I think for those really high risk patients, you escalate. And then for those low risk patients, you don't even need to do anything. Just watch them, mm -hmm. you know, scan and them periodically. Was this a scenario they looked at recurrence of a prostate cancer? Right. So people post, post radiation um, or post surgery. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Good to know. So, but you said the overall survival wasn't impressive. Well, it's still mature. Free survival. What's that? Metastasis free survival. The primary endpoint was MFS. Mm -hmm. Metastasis, Metastasis free, survival. free survival. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a surrogate for overall survival in prostate mm -hmm. cancer. Um, there's been a trend for overall survival, but the reason we don't have overall survival yet is because people with prostate cancer live a long time. And we're going to probably need another couple of years before we have mature overall survival data. So it's not to say, oh, it didn't make people live longer. So no, the data is just not ripe yet because people live a long time. You know, let's talk about the side effects of uh, any of those uh, castrating. All right. Well, yeah, we got, we got to find a different name for it. Right. So yes. not castrating treatments, but treatments that uh, bring testosterone to zero or almost zero. Same yeah. thing. But, you know, yeah. sounds a little bit better. Um side effects. All right. So when I see patients on ADT, my goal is one thing. 
if we can do anything synergistically to work against the cancer, that's just an extra kind of yeah. cherry on a cake kind of thing. What I'm really trying to do is preserve their quality of life. And what I'm truly really trying to do is lower their risk of metabolic syndrome, which I think is a, it could be a bigger killer uh, than even prostate, in some cases of prostate cancer. And, for them to have um, to to sustain good cognition, memory, and for the brain to work work well, these are the things that they're trying to accomplish. Um, so let's discuss some of those side effects. And you know, when you look at the data, what I look when you when I look at the data, it doesn't reflect my practice. So maybe it's because of the homo homogeneity of my practice, right? So these these are very motivated men; they're ready to kick butt despite the fact their testosterone is zero. What do I do? How do I do it? And they do it. And I just don't see metabolic syndrome. I see, I measure their, um, if I can, if they're coming to me, because sometimes I do the telehealth uh, or I find a way for them to measure through their gyms or anything, their body fat composition. Uh, they sustain muscle. They actually, um, some of them gain muscle, which is like, how, how is that possible? They're having, they have no testosterone. They can gain muscle. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Um, uh, you know, when you look at a DEXA, their, their, their bones are in good health, both baseline. And then after years, the quality of life is good with the exception of sexuality, libido, and, um, their ability to have intercourse. Th those are the two things, even hot flashes improve, whether it's because I do use black cohosh or the exercise or whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so what do you find is like, who, who is, um, who are you concerned with that comes in, I think from a curative perspective or managing their disease, you're saying they need ADT or something similar, but man, if I, if I give it to them, they may struggle with some other disease. And who do you say, look, I, it's, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. How do yeah. you make these type of decisions? Uh, I know you're in San Diego. These are surfers. He, who is that? <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Bagrodi has said, no, man, these 72 year olds are surfing out here. You know, they're yeah. like in great yeah. health. So maybe you and I are in a bubble and yeah. a homogenous uh, environment. But who would you say you would say, look, uh, the, the risk outweighs the reward with regards to ADT or to low T? Yeah, very good question. So I think um, the people that I think worry me are one, somebody who's had a recent cardiovascular event. They've had a recent heart attack, they've had a recent stent placed, mm. um, had a significant arrhythmia. Um, cause while the data around cardiovascular mortality mm. has been like limited and controversial, there is data that highlights that the people that are at highest risk of having a second cardiovascular event are people who go on ADT within six months of their first cardio or their, it, their whatever cardiovascular event they had preceding. Mm. So those people make me worried and we have to think long and hard about whether they need to go on ADT or maybe mm. we can get them through their initial six to 12 month period before we start it. Um, may maybe it's those people we're using drugs like Relagolixin um, that you can do. They're more cardioprotective. They're fast on, fast off. Other people that I think make me worried are, um, you know, individuals who are very frail. Maybe they have underlying Parkinson's disease or have other sort of issues that are affecting their mobility, cognition, their, um, just uh, get up and go that I'm just really worried that if I put them on hormonal therapy, I'm going to, I'm going to right now they're independent, but they're barely independent, but I'm going to make them not be able to do their activities of daily living. If I put them on ADT. Right. So those are the people who I think make me really worried. Um, but there's a lot, of, I mean, the side effect profile of ADT, it's very expansive, but there's, like you said, there's a lot that we can do to combat it with supportive therapies, with diet, with exercise. And half of what I do in clinic is talking about survivorship for patients that are on ADT and how we can ensure that their quality of life is the best that it can be and what strategies we can employ. And I think the goal is empowering patients um, mm. so that they can feel that they can do this. You know, like you said, sometimes people go on hormone therapy and it or they get their diagnosis, it's a, it's a reality check for them. It puts things in perspective. They start taking care of themselves more. They're exercising I saw better. A case like that today, yeah. PSA of 2000. He is, uh, and yeah, it goes up that high, folks, just to let you know, or even higher. PSA of 2000. Um, 
um, currently on, uh, actually he's on Dossie Taxol and um, uh, ADT Lupron. Um, what a great um, demeanor um, uh, for him. It definitely was a wake up call. He looks at life differently, all these things that I think it's amazing. Ac actually too bad that we need it. You know, we're hard headed, men are hard headed. They, most men without a diagnosis, they just don't make these kind of changes. Uh, mm -hmm. it's just the way it is. Um, so, he, you know, he does look at life that way. And one of the questions he asked, and I want to know your experience here, cause I don't have an answer. He's a Jamaican man. Men are Jamaican men are sexually active and proud of their sexuality. And he's mm -hmm. not active now. And he said, is it coming back? Will I be able? Mm -hmm. So have you seen men? on um, any of these therapies, androgen de deprivation therapies, sexually active? And if so, what are they doing? Yeah, I mean, um, they can be, um, absolutely. And I think that the other thing is to take away the myth that sexual activity or intercourse or drugs that help stimulate um, erectile function, they're not bad for the cancer. They're not counteracting what we're doing with the Lupron. They're perfectly fine, perfectly safe. It's totally fine to be on Cialis or Viagra while you're on ADT. Some men are able to be sexually active. There's pumps, there's injections. There's a lot that could be done and I fully support it. You know, um, you know, the I problem, think, however, is libido. Yeah. So yeah. I think they can get an erection. Trimix works well. But yeah. it's like, I not that interested. Uh, so yeah. and then testosterone does have an effect on erections itself yeah. biochemically. So what are the do you find patients that say, yeah, no, I'm into my girlfriend or my wife? And yeah, no. Oh, yeah. I, I definitely have patients who are on ADT. And their libido is not I mean, it may be a little bit blunted, but they still have sex drive. But then they're post maybe they're post-surgery, post-radiation, and now they're on hormones and like the combination of all these three things together, the likelihood that they're going to be able to have an er erection that they're satisfied with is very, very low. And I think there's a lot of, I mean, we talk about this in the clinic, there's a lot of ways to be um, intimate with your partner yeah. that doesn't necessarily involve sexual activity. and um, or, or it doesn't I, involve intercourse. Intercourse, exactly. You know, yeah. And so and I they think get, that and that... they get orgasms without, yep. uh, you know, without. It's, it's actually pretty fascinating how that works. Um, I've seen it on occasion, um, but certainly by and large, uh, it's a, it's a tough, it's, it's tough it's for, tough. for men it's very only tough. because of uh, the way they've described it. And my interpretation is, rather than your partner looking hot, your partner starts looking interesting, but you don't know why. <laughs> It's yeah. almost like a beautiful painting. It's like, mm, that's so, it's beautiful, but not hot. Not like that yeah. I want to be, you know, involved sexually with that person. So that's the way they've described it. Yeah. Powerful hormone testosterone. Last question. Yes, sir. Bipolar androgen therapy. So I am yes. hoping to get Dr. Sam Demid on the podcast. I'm working oh, awesome. really hard. He's wonderful. Um, he, he is. And, and I got a warm introduction. So um, I'm hoping to get him on. Um, to talk more about that. Um, for the audience, um, Dr. Demet is doing um, good research on bipolar androgen therapy at Johns Hopkins. And, and, and so that would be great for him to be on. Your view at this point with what you know, I know that uh, the research is limited. I know that they're looking at it more deeply. Number one, exp explain what bipolar androgen therapy is and should we, if somebody says, look, you'll pay out of pocket, your insurance doesn't cover it. Um, we don't have all the data. Would you suggest it? Uh, would you suggest someone to do it? Um, so very good question. And it is a therapy that is being investigated, just like any other therapy that's being investigated for prostate cancer. What bipolar androgen therapy is, is basically giving men who have hormonal resistant disease. So castration resistant disease that's right. become resistant to hormone therapies, giving them super therapeutic levels of testosterone to basically reprogram the cancer cell. Um, there's actually been a series of phase one and phase two trials that have been led by the Hopkins group evaluating this. And I think there's a lot of different strategies that are still being explored. Strategies looking at, you know, uh, do you do 
do you do cyclic therapy where you have one month on, one month off, one month on, one month off? Do you do adaptive therapy where you're on until your PSA rises, then you're off, then you go back on when the PSA rises again? Um, you're you on do, testosterone therapy. When you say on, right. you mean teeth. You're on testosterone therapy until your PSA starts to rise, then you come off of it, and then um, you know PSA drops, and then try to go back on when it rises again. So kind of this more adaptive strategy around PSA. There's data to suggest from the transformer study and others that maybe the bipolar therapy um, uh, sensitizes patients to antiandrogens. So you do a period on and then you go on drugs like Enza and you get a, bang, a long bang for your buck with the Enza after you do a drug like or after you do testosterone. So I think it's still being explored. And honestly, with us using um, a lot of our therapies earlier for metastatic hormone sensitive disease, you know, you could have somebody that's castration resistant. They've already seen Abby. They've already seen Dosi. They've seen Kabazi. Nothing to lose. You know, there's not, there's exactly like, you know, they don't have a gene that can be targeted. Um, they, they've maybe, maybe they've seen Plavicto or can't get Plavicto. So, oh, you know. I, I, so I wish you, <laughs> I wish you would not mention that. <laughs> because that's that was one of the questions uh, that I I'm like uh, 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 but that I wanted to ask about, but it's unrelated to Andrew deprivation therapy. Yeah. I'll let you finish your t thought on on BAT, and um, and you could give us a quick takeaway that I didn't yeah. get a chance in terms of pelvic. Yeah, health. no, I mean I think the there's actually a really nice um, patient guide on BAT um, written by Sam and Emmanuel Antonarakis, um when he was at Hopkins. Um, I think there's clinical trials. The next trial that's launching and accruing right now is called the Step Up Trial with uh, being run out of Hopkins. We're going to have it open here at UCSD soon. So, I, I mean, I think this is an experimental therapy just like any other and should be given a chance just like any other. The big yeah. problem with this kind of therapy is there isn't a big pharmaceutical company driving its entry into the clinic, which can sometimes make things challenging. Um, but Pluvicto, yeah. Right. yeah, go ahead. Well, um yeah, so these testosterone companies are not saying, "Hey, we'll let's do it." Uh, they're not really as in they, they have a lot to lose and not a whole lot to gain from putting yeah. a lot of effort and energy and resources into such a study. We're hoping yeah. that you know Hopkins gets good um, uh, funding uh, from outside sources, so hopefully they can fund it themselves with their uh, you know organizations and so forth. Um, so a so BAT bipolar androgen therapy. Uh, we don't know yet well. It seems like it does ha can have some legs. It's not approved as a treatment anywhere in the U.S., right? And no. if somebody wants it, uh, I would not know. Even Abraham Morgenthaler uh, in an email who sp speaks about it, but he's no longer practicing. What he does is he, um, if you are a practitioner that's interested in uh, doing this therapeutically for a patient, he guides you to do it um, in a uh, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't do yeah. it himself, um, that kind of stuff. All right. What's the quick Pluvicto? Um, what is Pluvicto? Um, it, 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 it's a lot of it. I think the just recent, there's a lot of uh, noise with Pluvicto lately. What is Pluvicto? Um, and does it have legs for advanced prostate cancer therapy? Yes. Um, so Pluvicto is a PSMA targeted radio ligand therapy where you have a small molecule that targets PSMA and it's linked to a beta emitting uh, a radio particle. So it yeah. binds to the prostate cancer cells that express PSMA. That's the key. They have to express PSMA. It's endocytosed into the cell because of the radiation effects. It induces DNA damage, causes the cell to die. And then there's a bystander effect to cells nearby. Um, the trial that led to its approval is called the vision study. Um, basically, this was end-stage patients, post-chemo, post-hormone th therapy um, that demonstrated this therapy improved survival. With ENZA, without ENZA? Is that that study? So, so in the trial, it was yeah. randomized to best supportive care. So it was best supportive care plus Levicto versus best supportive care alone. And best supportive care could be whatever the doc chooses to give them that's not chemo and not yeah. another radio ligand therapy. So some people were on ENZA, some were on Abby, some had radiation palliative radiation, some were on Decadron. So yeah. a lot of different things that they were on, but it was a positive trial. And I think this therapy is probably going to work its way earlier into the landscape. Um, there was a press release, um, I think last year, I can't remember when exactly for, uh, 
PSMA4, which is the pre-chemotherapy trial that was positive for PFS. We're going to be hopefully awaiting that data to get presented at a future conference. PSMA PSF addition. prostate-specific survival, just so that audience knows. Yeah. So, um, and then it's being tested in the hormone-sensitive setting, um, currently in a trial called PSMA addition. So, you know, it definitely has legs. I think the problem, you know, uh, not to say the problem, but there is huge supply uh, chain issues with right. availability of the therapy, which hopefully yeah. are being resolved. I think Novartis has literally built new manufacturing plants uh, to supply this therapy, um, but um, it is a, it is can be effective for some patients. Uh, but they need to. So the PSMA PET scan it needs to show up on PSMA PET Correct. scan. If it doesn't show up on PSMA PET scan, you're not a it's not a viable treatment because it's only when these molecules show up on a PSMA that yeah. is effective. Yeah, correct. Um, I knew that from um, lutetium 177, which is the same thing when they were doing it in Germany before we were uh, up to speed. Correct. Like 10 years yeah. ago, people were going to Germany from the US. You've been um, amazing, um, Rana. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've been generous with your time. You need to go to your kids. Sorry. Ah, the, you're the, awesome. you, you need to go back to, to those kids. And I think my kid, uh, my kid, I have one little one. He should be sleeping by now. Um, how can people find you if they want to be your patient and um, any other way of the, them finding you? Thanks so much. Oh, of course. My pleasure. It's been so great chatting with you. I feel like we can go on forever. Um, you know, I uh, have, um, uh, I guess, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that question, but on the UCSD website, you can certainly find me. I'm accepting new patients. Um, you can uh, contact our, our office. We have a new patient coordinator that helps get patients oh, in. So we're here to help any way we can. And you'll have, um, we'll have a link to your, um, to your office and all our platforms. Awesome. Right now, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And I hope to see you soon at one of our conferences or uh, we were talking about the next US, uh, UCSD conference. So I hope to see you there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gio. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Be well. Bye-bye. Okay. Till next time. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Dr. Geo podcast. You can watch all episodes of this podcast and much more by subscribing to my YouTube channel on youtube.com forward slash Gio Espinoza ND. If you love what you heard today, you can help by leaving a five-star review of the podcast on Apple and Spotify, as each review helps us reach more men who are serious about improving their urological health and how to function better with age. And for the latest research and actionable takeaways in the world of men's health, and integrative urology, sign up for my newsletter at drgeo.com. I'll see you next time.